back everybody it is the working brother back at you with another talk this time uh, we've got an american expat in the u.s it is a uh, robert bridge robert how are you doing welcome to the show thank you brother i'm doing okay i'm actually in uh moscow <laughs> yes yes you are we were gonna get to that yeah. and you have been there for how long now Oh my, uh, it's, it's about two decades now, two decades, yeah. I got two here decades. during the Yeltsin, Yeltsin, Yeltsin period, just as Yeltsin was um, being escorted out the door, wheelchaired out the door, that was <laughs> pretty much when I, uh, I got here, yeah, so. Well, uh, as far as uh, picking a time when to come to Russia, that seems like a good time to start. Um, keeping in mind um, that Yeltsin wasn't the best thing that happened to Russia. <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, the place was just, a, I mean, total chaos at the time, and uh, it, was just, it was just a complete mess, and I mean, that was kind of what attracted me to the place, though, it was just, um, I don't know, it was, it's kind of weird, but uh, there was just a chaos about, about the whole thing, and just being in Russia at the time, and uh, it was just uh, amazing, it was like landing on another planet, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but uh, I survived it. Here I am. <laughs> I watched an interview of yours with someone else doing some uh, background for this, and uh, you said that when you went to Russia, you knew no, you spoke no Russian, and it was your like first time abroad, basically. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was. I didn't have a passport before that, and you know, like a lot of Americans, and um, I, uh, I'll never forget the flight. It was terrifying. It was uh, Air France. The, the Air France was on strike at the time strange enough and somehow they still had pilots to fly the, <laughs> we, we it was in november we flew into a storm and it was terrifying we, we just hovered around sherry metro airport uh for a good hour trying i guess the pilots were trying to find whoever was flying the mechanics or whoever were flying was flying the plane <laughs> and uh yeah it was a memorable experience uh, so yeah um let's get into a bit of uh, who you are when one googles your name one comes across uh midnight in the american empire and uh it is a book that you've written um you also are a contributor to rt is that correct like how how exactly is that classified uh yeah i uh, i write uh i write op-ed pieces for rt i contribute uh less so now but uh, i'm still i still contribute now and then and uh the book yeah that book was written back in 2013 i um i had worked with a uh, couple major corporations in the united states particularly at&t and uh so this was just kind of my my take on corporate corporate the corporate world corporate jungle and um what i thought was wrong with it was essentially when we can maybe get into that a little bit if you want to but uh, just basically a lack of democracy uh so yeah <laughs> lack of democracy in the west i have no, no idea way. what you could be <laughs> what you could be hinting at um the other thing that i want to draw attention to considering it's your first time here and uh, your twitter profile says you're an unpaid comedian uh this is a quote-unquote comedy show you know to get past the youtube uh, algorithm spot uh, like censorship and whatnot because like basically uh you know nothing that we mention here has to do anything with reality it's all jokes and uh and parody um so i'm glad to see that that you're also a fellow comedian um and it says here you're followed yeah. by kim.com that's uh quite quite uh quite of a you know an interesting yeah, thing was, to have in your profile yeah he was promoting um he was promoting rt writers and uh he he happened to mention me one of my articles that i had written and um uh yeah he just started following me so i thought that was that was pretty cool that was a highlight of my <laughs> highlight of my career i suppose you could say so um, getting followed by Kim.com. Um, I shook Putin's hand once. You know, little things like that to keep you going. They, uh, you need those little, those little moments to, um, I don't know, not to brag, but uh, just whatever, get you, get, get, you, get you going through it all. That's good. That's good. It's the small things that matter. It's, uh, you know, the money, the money like gets you, 
to some point, but um, other things matter a little bit more sometimes. Tell us about this uh, Midnight of the American Empire. Tell us, because, uh, you know, uh, I actually studied economics and finance, like technically, so I uh, do have kind of an understanding and a background in, like, you know, let's say uh, the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> um, okay. So if you want to go into it a little deeper um, for some of our more astute uh, audience, we can uh, we can cover some of the intricacies. I haven't read your book. I look forward to maybe uh, flipping through it one day. But um, tell us uh, the ins and outs of what's going on there. Well, like I said, I, uh, I worked for AT&T for almost a decade. And um, through my experience there, I just I just realized that um, – you know, like like you said, you know, the, the whole notion of democracy in the West, it's just, it's ridiculous. It just doesn't exist. And especially in the workplace, um, uh, a lot of people laugh, for example, at the notion of, of, of the unions, the worker unions. But then uh, at one point, they were like, I guess, 30 some percent of the, the American workforce was unionized. Okay. Um, and they, the, you know, the unions were just constantly attacked called corrupt mafia you name it and yeah to a certain degree they were but um when you and it's this is this book just isn't about about unions but that's part of it the fact that if you don't have some sort of uh, democratic democratic call it let's call it democratic system in place uh within the corporation which the unions really are the only the only way to get that sort of um democracy where you have a um a representative body speaking for the workers. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have that, then the corporations will just take advantage of the situation, like they've done. I mean, union union membership now is down to about <clears throat> I forget, probably about seventeen percent of the. And you see the wages, the, the wages have is just that, is that collapsed. statewide? Is that statewide seventeen percent, or does it like vary from region to region depending on like you know whether it's blue or red? Uh, that's a good question. I'm really not sure. I think uh, nationwide, though, uh, I think it's I think the average is is about 17 percent across across the country. Um, so I just talked to about how corporations have corrupted uh, everything. Uh, <laughs> I talk about different. Um, it's been a while, actually, since I wrote the book, so I can't remember all the names of the court cases. But, um, you know, there's different different court cases that were passed. This, uh, for example, the South uh, Atlantic Railroad case. Um, which gives gave personhood to corporations. Uh, I mean, these corporations just have phenomenal power, and uh, they've just taken over, dominated the spirit of the country. Um, so, yeah, that's that's basically in a nutshell what it's about. And you know, there's like I talked to about. Um, I think one like one of the chapters that got a lot of attention was um, I talked about, for example. Uh, baseball stadiums, okay. Uh, for example, I grew up in Pittsburgh. We had Three Rivers, uh, Three River Stadium, and all these stadiums, for example, were taken over by uh, corporations, and they're named like Bank of America Stadium, and yeah, you know, um, it's just like it. It kind of killed the, um, I don't know how you call it, the poetry of the whole thing. You know, it's just like mm -hmm. you want to, you want to kind of when you go to a sports game. A sports match you want to kind of escape uh, that and forget about the outside world and and then here you are trying to watch a baseball game and you know just it just sounds it just seems very um it just goes to show how much corporations have really dominated uh the whole the whole social sphere and cultural sphere political sphere just boundless power that's never really been put into check so yeah, and how would you to. How would you contrast that? You say the book was written like 10 years ago or so. And how would you contrast that with uh, with uh, what's going on in Russia? Like, because uh, you now live there and you've been there for a while. So, and you're now a citizen, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, I got uh, Russian citizenship uh, about three years ago. So, yeah, I, uh, yeah I'm a dual citizen. Uh, you mean in terms of what, like the corporate aspect here in Russia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do do you see like a parallel of like the the you know erasure of some of these uh, cultural things from a corporatist aspect within the Russian culture and society? Well, I think uh, it's more like 
uh, yeah, of course you have a lot of companies that are you know dominant. I think that what's really changed is just the um, the way that people have uh, gone materialistic, uh, which is you know part and parcel of of the business world and corporations and all that. They've really um, gotten on board with materialism to a high degree. You you know you you walk around Moscow and everything is just about status and the, you know, the, the best clothes and sports cars. And yeah. uh, it's just really, yeah, it's just really dominated, um, which is kind of, I find that uh, a bit sad. It's kind of, you, you know, you talk about the Russian soul and the Russian spirit and um, it's just, uh, and when you, in order to find that now, it seems like you have to actually go into a church or to the village and you get reconnected with that feeling, but uh, otherwise, you know, when you're in Moscow, it's just like, um, and, and just really in your face consumerism, conspicuous wealth, and I mean, it's just it's out of control. Well, in my opinion, it's out of control. So, so you're um, saying, yeah. so you're saying, even though even though Russia is behind sanctions and is isolated, and uh, Putin is a dictator, um, there is still this uh, capitalistic veneer that's uh, washed over society and given it this like uh, plastic look and feel, basically. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, sanctions haven't. <laughs> say, say, believe it or not, yeah, sanctions haven't dampened the. Uh, the the uh, capitalistic spirit here at all it's uh quite the opposite and uh everybody's you know another aspect of it is the the, the mobile phones and the smartphones and when i first moved here everybody had their their noses into their books reading dostoevsky and uh tolstoy and whatever and now it's just all um you know staring into a black void and uh to, to and some not, extent you know. to some extent mm -hmm. i agree but when i was there and when i was there in november of last year um i was actually unbelievably surprised at how many people are still reading books like you know because like okay you're right there's a lot of people in the subway that have their fo faces in, in phones but still on every car there's at least one or two people that are still reading a book whereas you know in the enlightened west <laughs> where they ban Dostoevsky and Tchaikovsky, um, <laughs> you you can't really see that on the subway. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I'm, I'm actually I actually find myself taking pictures of people when I see them reading on the on the on the trains, and I just, I just because you just you just don't see it anymore. You think okay, maybe they're reading a book over their phone, but then you see what they're doing, and they're just playing some kind of mindless game, or uh, so I don't know. Um, it's just, and then you got the videos. Oh my God, the the uh, music videos and this whole—it's just such. I mean, how do you say demonic? I guess is the word. <laughs> uh, you know, we can throw around the word Illuminati and all this stuff, but man, I was like, I was sitting, I was sitting in a hamburger shop in a tiny town outside of Moscow, um, eating my lunch, and I'm just watching these these videos one after another. I mean, just the most demonic and evil messages and i ah, just you know russian rappers and all this this stuff that's just spilled over from the west here and uh, it just it just makes you wonder okay to what limit is this going to go because mm -hmm. if, if russia's going to survive it's got to like it's got to be able to say okay this is where we are this is where you are these are the borders we can't let this infiltrate too much because otherwise we're just going to be another you know um and then you, you can start talking too about uh, the, the LGBTQ and all this other ultra liberal stuff. I mean, they're they're taking steps to prevent this from happening. They're passing laws. You know, you can't. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, ask, what's your take on yeah. on this new law that was passed that like, uh, you know, bans uh, LGBTQ plus uh, people from uh, adopting children? I think it was or raising children, something like that. I didn't really get a chance to to look into it too much, but. Uh, yeah, I think that you know Putin passed a law. It was several years ago. It was they they called it in the West the anti uh, what was it anti homosexual anti law, law or something like yeah, that yeah. anti gay <laughs> law right right. Um, basically, they're just they just want to keep people. Um, you know, you can you can live whatever lifestyle you want. Rush you know do whatever you want in your in the privacy of your own home, but they just don't want people promoting this type of lifestyle. Um, on the, over the airwaves, over TV programs, commercials, you know, parades. <laughs> they don't want they don't want these rainbow parades going down, um, you know, towards the Kremlin, where the tanks once ruled down. Uh, that's just that's just uh, they just they're not going to let that happen. And um, 
I, I totally agree with that. I just, what's happening when I read about what's happening in the West with this whole LGBTQ and how they're talking to kids about, you know, sex and are you a boy or a girl I, I, in a math class? I mean, come on. I have, to interject, like, I have to interject and be a troll. So you're a right-wing extremist, right? Basically. Oh, of like course. In, yeah, in, in, the new par- in the new paradigm? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What do you call it? Um, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> do you consider yourself a right-winger? Um, cause I'm sure, I'm sure people who've read your stuff and seen, uh, you know, your takes, even some of them today, um, would label you as right wing. And when I say people, I mean like, you know, liberals in the West who consider themselves centrist. I just consider myself to be, uh, you know, normal. <laughs> I mean, you, just don't, you just don't, I mean, how could you, how could anybody think that it's, it's a good idea to talk to ki- talk to elementary school kids about you know are you a boy are you a girl uh, should this should we should we you know let's introduce pronouns are you you know he she what I mean it's just it's just gone to such a level of insanity that I I just can't understand how uh, wow it's just blows my mind that that things have gone off the rails so much and um, yeah I guess yeah conservative would be the word but um, I mean the left has just gone so insane that. It's just like it's it's gone beyond even the ability to uh, call it any sort of a political movement. It's just I just look at it as insanity, and I'm just I'm I just feel that I'm normal, and just you know I look back at my childhood growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and just the idea that something like this could take root, you know, even in a steel town like Pennsylvania, Steel City, Pittsburgh. It's just. It's uh, it's shocking. It's really shocking, and you just wonder what happened to the people. What are they putting in the water? That you know, that's mothers take their, and it, usually it's the mothers too, which is really another strange thing. They 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 take their kids to these st- strip shows and drag queen story hours and things like that. It just you just gotta ask yourself, what insanity is this? Um, it's just it's mind blowing, and you know a lot of you don't see you don't see fathers at these events too much. It's just mothers taking their kids and laughing and snapping their selfies and so um yeah i guess i'm conservative <laughs> <laughs> and um you peddle conspiracy theories apparently how long have you been uh, working for uh, a russian state uh, funded media quote unquote <laughs> <laughs> uh. Let me see. Um, and and was, did they make you paint your wall green? <laughs> my wall green. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they deduct that from the pay. Um, <laughs> no, I um, actually my wife pays me. She gets the she gets the checks, and I I just have to ask my wife for the money. <laughs> so, no. Um, yeah. Um, well, conspiracy theories, conspiracy realists, whatever. Uh, yeah, I've I've written a few. I've got uh, I've been criticized a few times for those articles, but um, I don't know. Somebody's got to tell the truth, right? <laughs> yeah, and the truth is, uh, you know, it comes out in the end, and it's a matter of perspective. Um, just before uh, we started recording, or let's say the day before, uh, you shared this with me, and this is from uh, Politifact, I think, or something. But is it politig- polygraph.info? And uh, this is them telling you that you're wrong about this original article that you uh, contributed to RT back in 2018. And uh, from me glancing at it, what I uh, guess is your take is that the whole Skripal thing was a preemptive Nord Stream, basically. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I think. Well, I don't think it's just pretty much obvious that uh, the United States was. They never wanted this Nord Stream to go through um, for many reasons. It, it gave Russia. You know, apparent power over over you know Europe and the ability to shut down. Although they've never shut down their energy, their uh, their uh, fuel sources before, um, even in the darkest moments of the Cold War, uh, they never liked the fact that Russia and Germany were building this bond uh, with each other. 
that was always like a nightmare situation. You have the industrial power of Germany with the manpower of Russia and the land resources and everything, and they never wanted that to happen. So, um, yeah, the writing was just on the law as far as Nord Stream goes, that eventually uh, they would find some sort of a way to, and they even came right out and admitted it, that, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, would, take, they would take some sort of action against it. So, um, well, you get these, these incidences like, you know, these, these mysterious deaths of, of people and um, in hindsight, you look at it and you can see that uh, they were building up this narrative that Russia is evil, Russia must be contained, Russia can't be allowed into Europe, da 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 da, da. And sure enough, you know, here we are. It's uh, <laughs> uh, um, got the same conspiracy sanctions. theories, I tell you, Russian propaganda. Russia was unprovoked. We'll leave a link oh, here yeah. to a, a very good talk <laughs> with with a with a friend of the channel, um, and uh, yeah, we all know Russia was unprovoked for like eight years. It was being unprovoked, and uh, I don't know what narrative you're talking about. That must be like uh, some other propaganda <laughs> <laughs> that I'm not aware of. Um, tell us, uh, tell us uh, what you think about the Russia unprovoked thing, being uh, being you know based in uh, Russia for you know the better half of the past uh, quarter century, um, and seeing uh, the anti-Russian uh, perspective, uh, you know, grow and uh, multiply. How 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 has that been uh, as an English speaker? behind the quote-unquote curtain um especially taking into consideration the escalation and like rhetoric and russophobia or hate um that's been going on recently like what what's your uh what's your take on it as like a westerner uh wow um it's just yeah it's just been like a slow brew uh happening uh, you know over the years just i mean it's just constant uh, they, they just uh, everything from the the propaganda that you read. I mean, it goes right. It can go all the way back to Hollywood films. They've just constantly. I was going to say Red Dawn. <laughs> from, yeah, from Red you know, you Dawn, get, basically. Right, right. You get the um, uh, the Hollywood propaganda, which built this narrative. You never see, you never ever see a uh, Russian in a Hollywood film who's a good guy, who's he's always the you know devious, dastardly guy. Uh, it starts like that. That's been going on for, of course, basically forever. Um, so, wow. And then you just get a, just con this constant move of NATO machinery and uh, hardware right up to Russia's border. The constant, uh, constant growth of NATO. They said they promised not to do that back in, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed. They said that they wouldn't move forward, but that's just it's just been just the opposite. They keep on creeping, creep mission, mission creep, whatever. Um, now, you know, the right smack up in, in against Russia's border um, in, in the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, now, you know, Finland, um, and then Ukraine, which is really, that was, that was really, well, it's, it hasn't happened yet with NATO, but it was, it was on the table. So uh, it's just, yeah, it was just con constant provocation, and um, so Russia had to do something eventually. They just—they're not going to let themselves be surrounded like that. They—they uh, they gave all the warnings that they thought necessary, and um, the West, the United States, NATO, whoever didn't heed the warnings, and they just kept pushing. So, uh, yeah, it basically just happened the way it had to. It was just inevitable that eventually. I mean, for example, you just reverse the tables, and if you you know you imagine Russia <laughs> pushing up from South America, you know, coming into Mexico, <laughs> replacing the the uh, who knows the drug cartel, and here's Russia. I mean, what would the United States do? So it's just it's just a, a physics, you know, it's just uh, pure physics. You you eventually you're going to have a response, and uh, that's what they got. That's what they got in Ukraine. They're never going to let Ukraine join NATO. It's just a fantasy. Uh, so yeah, just came out the way it had to. And uh, what uh, originally got you into the political analysis slash uh, commentating with RT? Like, uh, what was it that like drove you that you said, I got to contribute to this? Um, 
Wow. I just, uh, I, I've always been interested in, in politics. And at one point I was, you know, liberal. And, you know, once you, you wisen up, they say, you, the older you get, the, you know, once, once you reach a certain age, people mature into conservatism. Um, I've always been interested in politics. And uh, so I just... I just like the fact that RT and other other agencies here they they gave us they gave us the ability because you know before let's face it before RT and all these other alternative uh, channels came about there's just really the Western Voice out there the CNN the CNN ABC NBS whatever the Voice spewing all the the news and um, so that was when um, you know RT came. I think you, like, right, I think. I think you hit your uh, microphone cable or something like the plug. It, it started crackling. Yeah, maybe. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh no, your 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 audio is still crackly. The cable must be. Hello. Ooh. Ooh. Hello. I think you're gonna have to call me back. Call call me back. Call me back. And we're still here. Let's put this recording on pause. No, oh, we can't put it on pause. All right. And you're back. Can we hear each other? How's that? Yes. Excellent. Now let me see if I can center you here on screen. And uh, no, this one. There we go. Excellent. That was live. Okay, Everybody, cool. like, share, and subscribe for uh, fixing <laughs> technical difficulties live on the on the fly. Um, <laughs> all right, um, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, we were we were talking about how uh, CNN and the Western uh, media basically control the narrative until RT and some of these other voices came along. Yeah, well, I guess I guess it goes back to me arriving in Russia. I saw, you know, I got here and I realized that it's, it's, it wasn't the evil empire that that I had read about and heard about and believed my whole life. That you know, there are decent people here, fantastic people, just like anywhere. You know, I could have I could have decided to go anywhere, but um, uh, you know, coming to the so-called evil empire and seeing it with your own eyes that was just like an amazing experience. Uh, so that. That in itself gave me a desire to kind of want to, I mean, definitely want to express myself, express, you know, upset my family, <laughs> alienate my friends, tell people that they're, you know, they're crazy for thinking that Russia is this way, you know, um, spewing all my conspiracy theories and, you know, um, so I just like, I, I was, I just loved Russia. I just got, I was like, wow, this is such a, you know, cool place. It was, um, I mean, of course, chaotic as hell, but it wasn't. You know, it wasn't a threat, and uh, so, and when I joined our, our well, RT, that was uh, like right around. It was right after the Iraq War, actually. And I, I always thought to myself too, hey, that had had RT been around at that time, the, the, the which narrative. Which Iraq War? <laughs> uh, yeah, which one? That's yeah, the um, that's a good the second question. one. Uh, yeah, or, or, but or I was, the... actually, I, I think it was the first one. Um, All right. I mean, there could have been, there could have been. Actually, no. It was, it was the one with, um, yeah, Bush Jr. You know, they could have. Um, there would have been a different narrative out there, and they could have um, really. I think the war could have even have been avoided uh, because there would have been alternative voices. There would have been people on the ground there, and uh, they could have said, "Hey, you know, uh, just shown a different perspective." I mean, there was a huge outpouring of of anti-war sent sentimentism at the time. Uh, but had there been alternative media at the time, that would have really helped to show that there were no weapons of mass destruction, for example, in Iraq. And uh, so it could have helped stop that. So things like that, um, they just, you know, the Western media, as they as they want to now, they, they banned RT and a, a lot of other, I mean, the Internet. <laughs> you, the, wild, the wild, wild west days of the Internet are over, I guess, as you know. <laughs> You mean so, uh, you, you you mean a democracy is flourishing in the fascist West? I mean in the democratic uh, liberal West. <laughs> oh, it's out of control. Yeah, it's just. Uh... <laughs> it's funny because like sometimes to my Telegram, I'll post links from RT, and then and then subscribers have actually told me that like uh, they can't reach it from uh, Portugal and from Spain. Like they can't even see the link 
inside Telegram, which is insane. So then you have to like you know use uh, archive.net or whatever it's called and uh, get right. alternative uh, get them alternative options. But it's just funny. It's just funny that like you know the bastion of freedom. The first thing they did is as soon as the evil Russians um, went into um, stop the indiscriminate shelling of civilians um they banned rt <laughs> it's like yeah what? yeah exactly uh no no irony there at all no coincidence yeah uh yeah so yeah i think and i think really the when they really got they really re understood what a well a threat that russia was was when russia went into syria and took out you know isis within a matter of hours <laughs> yeah this this, this cal caliphate that was supposed to take over the middle east you know, that the united states couldn't have had no idea that the, the, these guys didn't have an, an air force they didn't have a navy they, but somehow the united states just couldn't spot them in the wide open desert they couldn't get them when they were traveling across with all their high-tech communications and everything and satellites they couldn't they couldn't take them out as they were traveling from Iraq to Syria. It was, you know, the Russia that had to go in and I show think, them how to do it. So I think the highlight of the whole Syria episode is that one article that, that's, uh, like, I think it's CNN or some, some Western outlet, definitely. That's like, you know, CIA forces are fighting uh, Pentagon forces in Syria. <laughs> <laughs> it's like free, freedom rebels on both sides. <laughs> you know that was the, that was the, that was the highlight for me. Yeah, they have to win one way or the other, right? Either the CIA yeah. or the Pentagon. <laughs> um. So. Yeah, but definitely the Russian the Russian intervention in uh, Syria definitely put everyone on notice, and it was the starting point in the change of Russia's uh, international politics slash image uh, shift. You know, from that aloof uh, superpower that's just chilling uh, and sorting itself out to a uh, player on the world stage that's trying to be a good neighbor and a friend. <laughs> Yeah, I'd yeah, say. that's so true. That really, that really woke up a lot of people, and it shocked a lot of people. That, uh, uh, yeah, they just um, they they put on display their their weapons, their cruise missiles, and their precision precision strikes, and all that. And uh, yeah, it was really. Um, I think that's really what put in put in motion this. It turned it turned the anti-Russian propaganda up to. Defcon, Defcon 2, whatever Defcon 1 is, <laughs> just a major, major panic in the Western world when that happened. So it, it was um, necessary. Is there anything else you'd like to cover before we call this uh, first intro to Robert as a, as a complete episode? Anything else I'd like to cover? Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, or draw attention to before we close off this first uh first little talk well, that we have i hate to sound like a travel agent but uh if anybody's you know if you really want to see russia and know what it's really like you just got to switch off your tv and try to find a way to get here and um boots on the ground sort of thing and uh yeah it's just uh russia's just a really cool place and um and it's just a shame what the uh the Western media has done in terms of it's you, you try to tell people what it's like and uh, even when they see it with even me when I'm out in the city I'm just I can't I can't believe what I'm seeing and how nice the place is and all that stuff and uh, so you, yeah uh, mm -hmm. you upload videos uh, regularly uh, to your telegram we'll leave a link down in the description for people um, and you're also on Twitter as we pointed out earlier followed by kim.com so we'll definitely leave a link to the, leave a link to that as well um and uh yeah personally uh having been to russia like i mentioned last november um definitely it's not even that difficult to get to russia like uh, you can go through dubai no problem you know you can go through turkey no problem and uh, yeah, I, tried, through I, tried going, I tried going i tried going from uh, from miami to moscow in a uh, couple about a month, two months ago, and uh, the Turkish airline got turned around like two hours after we let departed from Miami, and the the reason was uh, technical problems with the toilets. If you can imagine that, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it. Never heard of that before. But I had so, to sleep so, in Miami airport, and then uh, next day at four o'clock we took off again. It's just a nightmare. But, but uh, you made it. You made it. 
It's not impossible. Made it. That's what that's what I'm getting at. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Go on. Yeah, well, Turkish Turk the food on Turkish Airlines is really good, so I guess that had something to do with the collapse of the the uh, infrastructure <laughs> there on the pipeline. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. Um, Robert, thank you for stopping by. It's been an awesome talk. Everyone who's stuck Thanks. around to the end, thank you. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Check out the Patreon, and you can now buy me a coffee as well. Robert, we'll uh, you, pick brother. this up in a second with some more serious topics. Everyone, Fantastic. see you soon.